Two Plus Two Makes Crazy, written by Walt Sheldon in 1954. The little man had a head like an old-fashioned light bulb and a smile that seemed to say that he had secrets from the rest of the world. He didn't talk much, just the occasional, oh, mm, or ah. Creighton figured that he must be all right, though. After all, he'd been sent to the computer city by the information department itself, and his credentials must have been checked in a hundred ways and places. Essentially, each computer is the same, said Clayton, but adjusted to translate problems into a special terms of the division it serves. Creighton had a pleasant, well-behaved and personal voice. He was in his thirties and mildly handsome. He considered himself a master of the technique of building a career in Computer City. He knew how to stay within the limits of directives and regulations and still make decisions, or rather, to relay computer decisions that kept his responsibility to a minimum. Now Creighton spoke easily and freely to the little man. As public liaison officer, he'd explained the computer system hundreds of times. He knew it like a tech manual. But is there any real central control? Say in case of a breakdown or something of that sort. Little man's voice was dry and lava ash. Dry as the lava wastes between and beyond the cities. Tanta was the name he'd given, Mr. Tanta. His contact lenses were so thick they made his eyes seem to bulge grotesquely. He had a fake stoop and wore a black tunic, which made him look like one of those reconstructed models of prehistoric birds called crows that Creighton had seen in museums. Of course, of course, said Creighton, answering the question. It's never necessary to use all the circuit, but we could easily, in case of a great emergency. All the circuit? What is that? Mr. Tainter asked. Creighton gestured and led the little man down the long control bank. Their steps made precise clicks on the layer plast floors. The stainless steel walls threw back tiny echoes. The chromium molding glistened, always pointing the way, the straight and mathematical way. They were in the topmost section of the topmost building of Computer City. The several hundred clean, solid wedding cake-like structures of the town could be seen from a Polarflex window. The old circuit puts every machine in the city to work on any selection problem that's fed into the master control here. Each machine will give its answer in its own special terms, but actually they all work on the same problem. To use a grossly simple example, let us say that we wish to know the results of a two and two but we wish to know it in terms of total security. That is, we wish to know that 2 plus 2 means twice as many nourishments units for the Department of Foods, twice as many weapons for the Department of War. That is perhaps not necessarily true according to the current situational adjustment in the Department of Public Information. At any rate, we would set up our problem on the master, pushing the button 2, then the button plus, and the button 2 again as a primitive adding machine. Then we would merely throw it all switch. A short time later, the total answer to our problem would be relayed back from every computer, and the cross-comparison factors cancelled out, so that we could have the results in terms of familiar verdict statement. And, as everyone knows, the electronically filed verdict statement makes the complete record of directives for the behavior of our society. Very interesting, said Mr. Tainter, the little crow-like man. He blinked rapidly, stared at the switch, marked all that Creighton was pointing out to him. Creighton now folded his hands in front of his gold and black tunic, looked up in the air and rocked gently back and forth on his heels as he talked. He was really talking to himself now, although he seemed to address Tanta. You can see that the computer system is quite under our control in spite of what these rebellious underground groups say. Uh, underground groups? asked Mr. Tainter mildly. Just his left eye seemed to blink this time and the edge of his mouth gave the veriest twitch. Oh, oh, you know, said Creighton, the organization that calls itself Prims, Prim for Primitive. They leave little cards and pamphlets around, damning the computer system. I saw one the other day. It had this big title splashed across it. Uh, our new tyrant, the computer. Uh, the article complained that some of the new labor and food regulations were the results of the conscious reasoning on the part of the computer. Devices to build the computer bigger and bigger and bigger at the expense of ordinary workers. You know the sort of thing. But it is true that the living standard is going down all the time, isn't it? Asked Mr. Tanter, keeping his ephemeral smile. What about those 3,000 starvation deaths up in Hydrobara? Creighton waved an impatient hand. There will always be problems like that here and there. He turned and stared almost reverently at the long control rack. 
Be thankful that we had the computer to solve them. But the deaths were due to diverting the basic carbon shipments down here to Computer City for computer building, weren't they? Now, there, uh, you see how powerful the propaganda of the Prince can be. Creighton put his hands on his hips. That statement is not true. It simply isn't true at all. It was analyzed at the computer some days ago. Here, let me show you. He took several steps down to the corridor again and stopped at another panel. We first collected from the various departments, food, production, labor, and so forth, all the possible causes of starvation deaths in Hyderabad. Computer administration had its machines translate them into symbols. We're getting a huge new plant and machine addition over at administration, by the way. At any rate, we simply registered all the possible causes with the master computer, threw in the circuit marked validity selector. Out of all of the causes, the computer picked the one that was the most valid. The Hydroborough tragedy was due to lack of foresight on the part of Hydroborough's planners. If they had a proper stockpile of basic carbon, the thing would never have happened. But no community ever stockpiles, said the little man. That, said Creighton, doesn't alter the fundamental fact. The computer never lies. He drew himself up stiffly as he said this. Then abruptly, he consulted the chronometer on the far wall. Excuse me for just a moment, Mr. Tanter, he said. It is time to feed the daily tax computation from finance. We have to start a little earlier on that these days. Uh, the new taxes, you know. As Creighton moved off, Tanter's thin smile widened just a little. As soon as Creighton was out of sight, he stepped with his old crow-like stride to the numerical pedal, punched two plus two, and then adjusted the operations pointer to hold. After that, he punched three plus one and hold once more. He moved over to the validity sector, switched the numerical panel in, closed the circuit. In his dry voice, he murmured the whole control pack. Three plus one makes four. Two plus two makes four. Three plus one, two plus two. Tell me which is really true. All through the master computer relays, clicked and tubes glowed as the problem was sent to all subcomputers in their own special terms. Food, production, labor, public information, war, peace, education, science, and so forth. All over the computer city, the solenoids moved their contacts and the filaments turned cherry red. Oscillating circuits hummed silently to themselves in perfect cue. The life warmth of hysteresis pulsed and throbbed along the wires and channels. Three plus one, two plus two. Tell me which is really true. The problem crisscrossed in and out, around about, checking, cross-checking, rechecking, as the computer thought about the problem. Which was really true. Even before Creighton returned, parts of the computer had begun to get red hot. It hummed in some places, and in other places, relays going back and forth, and indecision made an unhealthy rattling noise. Little Mr. Tanter beamed happily to himself as he recalled the words of his old directive. The computer itself had issued in a matter of public thought control. When a brain is faced with two absolute equal alternatives, complete breakdown inevitably results. Mr. Tamter kept smiling and rocked back and forth on his feet, as Creighton had done, before nightfall. The computer would be as useless an overheated mass of plastic and metal. He took a printed folder from his pocket and casually dropped it on the floor where someone would be sure to find it. It was one of the pamphlets the Prims were always leaving around. End of story. I'd quickly like to thank the T5 peeps, Cold War Boomerwaffen, Severin Cerberus, Bushmaster 177, Henry the Red, Caspar Arnholtz, Cold War Boomerwaffen, Elijah Silvercross, Dragzoon WRE, and Severin Cerberus. Thank you very much.